In this video, I wanted to demonstrate the complete glucose assay. Uh, so once I had fixed up the, uh, the glucose assay reagent, uh, the assay was working fine. Now I know many of you had gotten to the actual glucose assay and had started to perform it, which is good. So you've had the chance at least to go through the, the motions. Uh, now of course, since the, the glucose assay reagent wasn't working, then you just didn't see the color change. Um, so what I wanted to do is to demonstrate the whole procedure from start to finish, including the color change and setting up of the plate at the end, which we had only started in the class. Um, so that way at, at least you've, um, you've seen it and can piece it together with, with the bits that you did do. Now if you recall in class, you ended up with 36 14 mil falcon tubes, each of which contained half a mil of your starch digest, to which you had added 10 mils of 80% volume to volume ethanol. So then just to keep everything in order, what I would usually do is to put all those tubes out into a rack um, so that you can see them in order and you can deal with them systematically. Next, a couple of you noticed in class and uh, made the comment that the starch digest material in the 14 mil tubes uh, actually has a bit of food sort of still floating around in it. And you wondered whether or not that would affect the absorbance of the light uh, in the in the 96 well tray. Um, and, the, and the answer is that it will. So what I decided to do was to first of all clarify those solutions by spinning them. Now you can spin the 14 mil falcon tubes, but they're quite big. Uh, and of course you need to balance each of the tubes and make sure they're exactly the right, uh, the right weight. One way of getting around having to do that is by making much smaller tubes of exactly the same amount of each of those starch digests. So if we take one mil of starch digest and put it into a 1.5 mil Eppendorf tube, uh, and then spin all those Eppendorf tubes, then all the food debris gets drawn down to the bottom and, uh, and we're left with a clear solution. So that's what I'm doing in this bit. Uh, so first of all, I set up 36 tubes, uh, 1.5 mil Eppendorf tubes, of course, labeling the top so we don't get all the, the treatments mixed up. Then I find it useful just to open up all the tubes so I can keep track of which ones I've done. And then as I add a sample to each tube, I then just close them and you can see what you're up to more easily that way. And then into each tube, I place one mil of starch digest. And of course, then we repeat that for all 36 tubes. Next, we need to set up yet another set of 36 tubes for our treatments and another six tubes for our glucose standards. These are the tubes that we will actually be performing the glucose assay reaction in. And of course, we label all of them. Then having done that, we can spin our samples. In this case, we've set the centrifuge to 2000 G for 60 seconds. And what that does is draw all the food debris down to the base of the tube, leaving anything dissolved in the solution up in the supernatant, um, giving us a clarified solution uh, for use in this assay. Now we repeat that until all 36 tubes are spun. Now we have our treatments, and so we can add the amount of treatment that we need to each of our reaction tubes. Now, as shown in your updated practical notes, both the glucose standards as well as the treatments are going to be done in a total volume of 500 microliters of solution. We're going to do both the standards and the treatments in duplicate on the 96 well tray. And so what we need to do is transfer 0.1 mils, or in other words, 100 microliters from each of these spun sample tubes into our reaction tubes. Once we've done that, the last thing we need to do before the reaction is make up our glucose standards. Now when I performed these reactions, one thing I noticed was that many of the samples were darker than the darkest solution of the glucose standards 
So in other words, the treatments actually had more glucose in them than the maximum of the glucose standards. Um, so I did two things to try to solve that problem. Uh, one was that I increased the range of the glucose standards in, uh, from 10 millimolar or 1.8 milligrams per mil up to 20 millimolar glucose. So that way the glucose standards covered a larger range. And I also diluted the uh, treatments by half. So in other words, they were half as concentrated as they were before. Now just for your records, I performed that dilution after the reaction. And I'll point that out again in the video once we've seen the reaction. So to make up the glucose standards, uh, what we need is some row water, which is just reverse osmosis water, and also our maximum glucose concentration, which as I say, I adjusted later to be 20 millimolar of glucose, um, or in other words, 3.6 milligrams per mil. The first of the standards is zero glucose. And so of course we just take one mil of water and add that to tube one. Now the other five tubes are going to contain 0 0.018 milligrams per mil of glucose, 0.18 milligrams per mil, 0 0.9 milligrams per mil, 1.8 milligrams per mil, and 3.6 milligrams per mil. To make those dilutions, we simply add the water that we need to each of the tubes. So in other words, we add 500 microliters of water to tube 5. 750 microliters of water to tube 4, 900 microliters of water to tube 3, and we need to add 990 microliters of water to tube 2 since we are doing a 1 in 100 dilution of tube 5 in order to make 0 0.018 milligrams per mil of glucose. Now we are ready to add our glucose. And so we add 10 microliters of tube 5, or in other words, 10 microliters of 1.8 milligrams per mil glucose, giving us a 1 in 100 dilution. And so now in tube 2, we have 0 0.018 milligrams per mil. Into tube 3, we add 100 microliters of tube 5. So in other words, 100 microliters of 1.8 milligrams per mil, giving us a 1 in 10 dilution. In tube 4, we add 250 microliters of the 3.6 milligrams per mil glucose, so the glucose from tube 6, which gives us a 1 in 4 dilution of the maximum concentration. Then we add 500 microliters of the full strength, 3.6 milligrams per mil, into tube 5, giving a 1 in 2 dilution or in other words, 1.8 milligrams per mil. And lastly, in tube six, we just add the full strength, 3.6 milligrams per mil glucose for our final standard. So these are our standards. And having done that, we now add 100 microliters of each of these standards to the reaction tube for those standards. Now with our heating block preheated to 37 degrees Celsius, we are going to add our glucose assay reagent to each of these tubes. Now, each tube needs to incubate for 30 minutes exactly. Now, since it takes a couple of seconds to handle each tube, so to take it out of the heat block, open it up, and then add the stop solution, we actually need to add a bit of time between each tube. So every 30 seconds, until all the tubes are done, we add the glucose assay reagent. In other words, we take one of the reaction tubes, add 200 microliters of assay reagent, and place the tube into the heating block, then wait 30 seconds before taking the next tube and adding 200 microliters of assay reagent to that tube, and then putting that on the heating block, and so on, until all the tubes are done. You then wait until 30 minutes has passed for the first tube you treated, and when it has, 
you add 200 microliters of the stop solution, which in our case is 12 normal sulfuric acid, or in other words, 6 molar sulfuric acid. When you take each tube from the heat block, you should notice that it's turned brown. This is the oxidized adenosidine. When you add the sulfuric acid, the brown oxidized adenosidine turns pink, and that's the stabilized reaction product. And it is the absorbance of this stabilized product that we will be measuring in the spectrophotometer. Now it was at this point that I noticed that many of the reaction tubes were darker than the maximum glucose standard solution, suggesting that they had more glucose in them than the 20 millimolar or 3.6 milligrams per mil maximum glucose concentration of the standard. So at this point I decided to dilute each of the treatments by half, which I did by adding more sulfuric acid. Having done that, I then loaded each of the samples and the standards onto the 96 well plate as shown in the plate layout diagram in your notes and also shown here. The most recent corrected notes that I sent you contain this updated plate layout diagram. Once the plate is loaded, it is read on a spectrophotometer. In this case, the spectrophotometer used was a Clariostar by the company BMG. Once the spectrophotometer has read the absorbance in each of the wells, a table of raw data is generated. I've now sent you this raw data, and so what you should do is plot a standard curve using the glucose standards, and then read off what the concentration was for each of the treatments. I hope this video illustrates the process that you go through for conducting the glucose assay, both for the people upstairs who were doing the assay themselves, but also for the people downstairs who were performing the blood glucose analysis.